So for, for the brands that are doing this now, I would say they're, they're early to the party. So, so like, how do you see this evolving? And like, I'm sure you do because you're running your whole business on it, but do you see this as the future of like brand communities and brand social? And we are cooking. Mike, how you doing, man? What's going on, Ben? What's going on? Excited to be here. You and me both, dude. So where, whereabouts in the world are you right now? Because I know you bounce around. Yeah, I am currently in Medellin, Colombia right now. You're in Medellin? That's, that's so funny. Yeah, uh, yeah. One, of my, one of my best buddies was, was uh, recently just there and he's spent a ton of time. So I definitely want to pick your brain on, on the whole traveling stuff. Definitely. But because that was one of the first things that I noticed about you is that you're, you're talking about the same stuff that we talk about, but you're, you're in a ton of different locations. So we'll definitely get to that. But first, let's start off with your story that even brought you to this world because I've, I've heard it from your content, but for anyone listening who has no clue, share it with us. Yeah, man. So I grew up and, you know, lived what I call like the, the typical life in the U S right. Go to school, get good grades, go to college. Uh, and the goal for me was always like, okay, I was super into numbers, super into like math, logic, computer science. Uh, so the, the vision for me was always like, okay, I want to work for a tech company, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe data science, uh, you know, somewhere, somewhere in that realm. And a few years after college, I kind of had achieved that, right? I was in New York City. I'm working in Manhattan. I'm working for a tech company. I'm on the, the data analysis team. And like, I got to this point where I realized like, this isn't really what I want to do, right? I, I, I got to the point and I was like, this, this isn't for me. Um, during that whole process, I constantly was like trying what I call, you know, the side hustles, yeah. the stuff that everyone does, right? You got the Shopify store, Amazon FBA, the drop shipping, right? The, the classic, just spinning wheels, right? Just trying different yeah. stuff, running Facebook ads, all this other stuff. Um, COVID hits, which was a huge wake up call for me because it just, it changes everything, right? Changes my environment, changes what I'm doing. I leave New York City because New York was just like a kind of a bad place. Um, still kept my job, but I, I moved back to my mom's house at the time, right? Our, our whole family kind of went there. Um, that's when a lot of things started like clicking for me and realizing, okay, it's kind of now or never, like I kind of want to bet on myself, go all in. And at the time, you know, one of these current side hustles that I had was actually producing income, right? One of the, one of the first that like, it wasn't just, you know, taking a loss financially. Yeah. Um, I was running ads for affiliate products. Uh, so I didn't own any products. I didn't have any clients at the time, anything like that. I was just running ads on, on Facebook and YouTube. Um, what ended up happening was I left my job in New York and I moved down to Mexico with a buddy of mine who was doing something quite similar as well. And that's where kind of the entrepreneurial world started for me. Um, started building up my own agency. Didn't really have a ton of success with that. Was doing a little bit of Facebook ads, a little bit of YouTube ads, cause that's the experience I had. Eventually I get on TikTok and this kind of just evolves where like I'm helping clients to find content creators to work with either on like an affiliate basis or, you know, just, just to kind of partner up. And then this starts to snowball into more and more and more. And I basically see the writing on the wall with Facebook ads kind of going like that and they're getting harder and harder and everybody and their brother offers Facebook ads. Yes. And then TikTok, on the other hand is like this new platform and everyone's like, Hey, what, like, what are you doing over there? Like, how do you do that? Like, can you kind of show me about this? You know? And so I just said, okay, you know what? It's time, it's gonna be a little painful. I'm no longer doing any ads, no longer Facebook, no longer YouTube. We're going all in on TikTok. Um, and that's kind of brought me to, to where I am today. Yeah, damn it. So that's, I love that, that you're just trying everything because I was in the exact same boat. And then finally, once something sticks, it's, it's, it feels like everything was finally worth it. Because until you get to that point, you're just spinning your wheels, spinning your wheels. So what was it like when you, so you got a bit of success with the paid ads and then you saw this new frontier of TikTok. But if you were having success with the previous outlet, like what was it in TikTok that made you feel like this is it, I'm diving in? Well, the, the first thing is like the success with the previous outlet, like I could see it slowly declining. Okay. Like Facebook ads were just getting harder and harder. And like I had my Facebook ad account banned as millions of other people and like getting another one. And then like, you know, you spin up another one and then the other one gets banned. And then it's like, you just see this writing on the wall and you're like, okay, this is, that's not it, right? There's something wrong here. And then on the flip side, you see TikTok where it's like, I put out a video and you know, it, it gets some decent traction and like people are starting to schedule calls with me. And like, there's just so much like momentum over there. I knew that like, okay, this is, this is where it's gotta be, right? This is like where things are going. Let's, let's be forward looking here and not try to like hold on to something that 
you know, I don't see a long-term vision in it. Yeah. And so many people did create so much success for themselves off the early days of Facebook ads. Like some of the major brands that we know were literally built off the back of Facebook ads. So it just kind of became a thing. Like you start a business, you run Facebook ads, but it has gotten to that point where it's becoming more expensive. It's, and it's more difficult to do. There's just so much competition. So TikTok is providing a new frontier for all that. But within TikTok, people love it because there's super high organic reach, which is fantastic. But I think the biggest flaw with TikTok is that so many people aren't leveraging it from a business perspective. So like, obviously right. that, that's like the, the thesis of your entire agency, but how did you, how did you see that opportunity that like this needs to happen? So it first started, um, more from the like, if you kind of put yourself in my shoes, coming from the agency perspective where like I'm working with clients and some of them are running Facebook ads, YouTube ads. And a lot of them, I told you before I was running ads for affiliate offers, right? So I had some experience in like the affiliate world. And so a lot of it started where like these businesses, they wanted to find more affiliates, right? And so I see, okay, these people on TikTok, this guy's got a hundred thousand followers. He's getting crazy views and he's not making a dime. What if I just kind of plug him with this affiliate mm -hmm. offer over here? Now he's making a little bit of money. The, the client I have is happy because now they have affiliates too. And then I was like, oh, there's something here, right? And like, Meanwhile, I'm, still, I'm doing a ton of ton of things, right? I'm running a YouTube ads, I'm running Facebook ads, doing way too much. I'm in that stage in the business where like someone asked me to, you know, like pick up their kid from school <laughs> for a thousand dollars, and like I'm doing it. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you're in that early stage where you're just you're just kind of scrapping to to keep things going. Um, but yeah, I, I start to just like connect businesses with affiliates and help them um, to find find these affiliates on TikTok. And that kind of evolved to where it is now where like most content creators, they're not gonna work off of an affiliate basis, right? Like maybe a year ago on TikTok, like, yeah, that's the case. But now it's more like, okay, you know, you, you want me to do a post about you, you gotta pay mm. me. So like the affiliate portion is not there anymore. Like we don't, we won't do any affiliate deals at all. Um, it's all, you know, if, if you're a brand and you want a sponsorship with a content creator, of course you gotta pay or you want them to, come in and be like the face of your brand. Of course, there's, there's something there. Sure. Can you walk me through? Cause so your agency for anyone who hasn't heard of it is brands meet creators. That's correct, right? Yep. Brands meet creators. Can you walk me through the process of how you go about finding that brand that see the value in this. And then also finding creators that fit the need because everyone thinks that it's super easy just to grab their phone and then now they're a creator, but there's so much more that goes into that. So how do you do that vetting to make sure that both sides are happy? Yeah. So on the brand side, what will happen is they'll come on board as a client and they'll go through this process with us where we're asking a, a ton of questions, right? Tell us a little bit more about your brand. Like, how do you guys perceive yourself, right? Are you more of like a, like a serious brand or do you guys have kind of like the humor element, right? Just, just diving deeper into like, okay, what is that brand persona, right? What are they about? Get to meet the, the people that actually, you know, own the brand. So you can kind of feel them out a little bit. Um, and then from there, kind of get in their head and it's like, okay, who's your ideal content creator, right? Like show me five examples of someone that you could potentially see being like the face of your brand. And so the first part is really just like that communication and understanding on the brand side, right? And then once I have a clear picture of like who I'm looking for, then we go out and find that person. And and oftentimes that like who we think we're looking for isn't, isn't, isn't actually it in the end, right? Because a lot of times a brand will think like, okay, this is exactly what we want. Uh, but after some deeper communication, right, maybe it changes a little bit. And then from there, I've just developed this huge network on TikTok of creators who like, they want to land brand deals, right? They want to bring these opportunities. They want these opportunities. So it's like a huge win-win for like me and my audience. So instead of me, like, you know, I'm trying to like sell something or like whatever, I'm trying to get people to like, oh, go, go, you know, get my free thing. It's like, no, like sign up for my email list and like, you're gonna get like five brand deal opportunities every week. Like, okay, that's a no brainer. Um, so a lot of times on the creator side, I just have though, I, I'm kind of just attracting those people. So a brand will sign up and we'll get a hundred content creators to apply. Uh, so we have this huge list to choose from. And then also my, my team too, they'll go out there and we'll do like some outreach. So, you know, if a brand tells us, hey, we want a female 24 to 30, uh, vegan, they do recipes, whatever, something super specific, then like, we'll go out there, we'll find them, message them, get them to apply. Um, but that's, that's kind of how that process works on the brand side. That's amazing, man. And I think that's probably the biggest hurdle that brands have when they try to do this, because it usually just, they, even for those that see the value and they believe in it, 
they just can't execute in finding that person and also equipping them with what they need. So right. I, I love that you're, you're filling that. So for, for the brands that are doing this now, I would say they're, they're early to the party. So, so like, how do you see this evolving? And like, I'm sure you do because you're running your whole business on it, but do you see this as the future of like brand communities and brand social? Yeah. I mean, every, just like putting the brands aside for now, where social media and where marketing is going, it's more like person to person. And you see all these platforms, they're going short form, vertical video, right? Every single platform is starting to look like TikTok yeah. because it's more, it's more personal, right? Yeah. You know, you're seeing less and less of the, you know, the, the million dollar production value commercial come across, right? Like, you know, you know, people can shoot a commercial just like this that's just as effective, if not more. And like brands are starting to realize that, but it's just a different process for them. So yeah, I do see that like going forward, brands are going to need people that are creating content, right? And I think a lot of them, like right now, it's a lot of uh, like contracted work almost. I think a lot of these brands, they're gonna bring people in house, right? Mm. And that's gonna be a full time six figure salary, right? Like you're working for this thousand plus person company and you're a content creator. And like you're at their office creating content, right? And they have like a, a full like studio in there to create content. Uh, that's where it's going. That's so exciting, man. And as, as a creator who, like, I think obviously we both align that we saw this and like we think this is the future and I truly believe that it will come to be. But there's so many people who still are stuck in the conventional ways of thinking where like, like that's not a thing. So can you, can, can you show me the other side of the coin? So like the brands that are doing like the, the biggest mistakes that you see from brands, I guess would say, and then like why what you just talked about is the future. So some of the biggest mistakes I see from brands, one of them is just like having that older legacy mindset of just like a lot of them just want to sell. Yeah. Right. And like the, these platforms are not really built for that. Um, like if you just make a video that's just like crazy, like product focused, right. And it's all about sell, sell, sell. And it's not about like build a community, make connections, create some type of value, give people a reason to follow, to stay involved, give them a storyline, right? Give some people something to latch onto as opposed to like, let's, you know, shove this thing down someone's throat. Um, that's not always the case. That's, that's kind of the one like far end of the spectrum, I would say. Another hurdle for a lot of brands too is like, it's not a direct response, immediate ROI play, right? Like it's something that takes some time and it's not that cheap. Uh, so it's not for everyone, right? It's like, yes, if you want to build a community, you want to build a brand that's going to, you know, withstand the test of time. It's not something where like, you're going to throw a couple thousand dollars at a content creator and three weeks later, like, boom, it's done. Um, so that's like another hurdle that a lot of these brands kind of have to get past. Yeah, I, I agree with that totally. I think too many brands view their approach to social as like transactional. Yeah. And I think that is the to complete opposite approach of what people need to be looking at it because it, the value comes in the long-term thinking of what does this mean? And, and when you have a connection with someone, I actually just made a video like this recently on one of my channels about why podcasting in particular is so powerful. And I would say TikTok can be the same thing if you're doing it the right way. But it's once people feel like they know you, even if, especially if you're a business, they're going to stay with you. And the cheapest customer to acquire is the one you already have. So if they even think twice before they cancel your product because they know you, that is wildly powerful. Because like, I know some of the brands that I that have great social presence, I will think about that person on the other side of the like, on the screen before I close or, or don't buy, like, like, things like that. So it's, it's really, really cool. So like, what brands have you seen that see that value? And then for those that maybe don't, how do you communicate that to them? Yeah. And, um, one, one other point I want to make too, on what you were saying with like building that connection and like having that, like basically you, you know, the brand, it's something that you probably see this as well, but like some of the, I want to say like easiest clients to onboard are the ones that were like, I talked to them the first time and they're like, Mike, how's Columbia? Yeah, like, exactly. How's this and that going? It's like, and it's like, they know you, right. They know you, they know your brand, And it's like, there's already this like deep bond formed, right? Yes. And so like, you'll have those people, and this is this is coming from me as like a personal brand, um, but also as a, a brand that's selling like a physical product or whatever, you know, you get those people who are like in that tight community. When you launch your next product, guess what? They're gonna Ooh. be the ones that are buying, right? And like, that's, that's what it's about developing. 
Um, your your other question with I think it was like how do you how do you get that through to brands? Um, it's a it's a really good question because I, it's something that actually you know I, I kind of have some difficulty with. Um, typically, I see the clients that like come on board with me are the ones that like they've kind of already made that decision, right? They see the power in building a community. They see the power in TikTok. So for me, it's a it's a much easier process as opposed to like okay, I got to sell this person on TikTok. I got to sell this person on building a community. And then I got to sell them on me as well. Yeah, and yeah. so like, I'm not going to lie. It's been like when I, you know, when I, when I first start to engage with like a potential client who they're not really sold on TikTok, they're not really sold on building for the long term. Um, it's a challenging process. And it's one that like, I don't have a great answer for how I can over overcome that with them. Um, I think the, I think probably the, the best way for them is to just like, start to see, you know, the the brands on the platform who have grown for a while, you know, they were there early, uh, just see, you know, what that's done for them. Yeah, I think time and then mark, the market itself and, and individual successes of different companies who did believe in it will just bring more and more people. And I think a lot of people uh, who run businesses and, and they, they, they can't sell, it's like sometimes you don't have to and your content is a perfect example of that. And I always say this too, yep. when you build a, a brand and people know, like, and trust you, like sales calls aren't sales calls anymore. They're onboarding calls because they've already made the decision when they reach out to you. So it's, it makes the whole process so much easier. So that's awesome, man. I, I love that. And I, I've been watching your stuff for a long time, but I started to look more into your agency and I was just like, in your business, I'm like, that's so, that's so smart because that's such a gap in the marketplace. And when you can find those, those connections, it just, it makes so much sense. So I want to talk more about TikTok strategy from like the creator's point of view and growing on that platform. What are your yeah. like biggest, cause like, you talk about growth periodically, but it's more about the brand stuff and, and things of that nature. So like, w when people ask you growth based questions, what are your typical tips for people who, when they're obsessed with that? Because everyone's so growth, 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 growth. Yeah. It's a great question. And I, I typically like to, uh, to kind of take a step back with that one. And one thing that a lot of people will focus on is like, okay, views, followers, how do I maximize that? But I like to take a step back and ask like, is that actually what you want, right? Is that really the goal? Um, and and once you kind of start to peel back that layer, you know, for most people, that's not actually the goal, right? That's what people think the mm -hmm. goal is. Like, oh, if I get a million followers, then I made it. Then like, you know, uh, the business is great, right? Whatever, whatever the, the thing is. But like nine times out of 10, that's not actually the goal. And I talk with the creators all the time that have a million followers or they have 4 million followers and like, they're not really making money from it because all they focused on was like, how do I get as many views as possible? Um, and I'll talk to people like, they, they know how to work the algorithm, right? They know how to game it where they get a hundred thousand views every time, but those views are worthless because like they're, they're, they're not even in the, the videos, right? They're just using like images or they're using like cropped videos somewhere else. And like, They've gamed it. They know how to get all the views. They know how to get all the all the likes, all the shares, all, all the metrics, whatever it is. But that's not really the goal at the end of the day. So how I like to think about it is two parts. Like, yes, growth is super important. Of course, I want my account to reach uh, a million followers, right? So like, I'll make videos with that in mind. We're like, okay, this is uh, strictly to get like more eyeballs to my account. But then I'll also make a lot of videos where it's like, I know this is not gonna be viral. I know this is gonna be one of my lower uh, viewed videos, but like, this is gonna be such a super high value touch point for every single person that sees it, right? The video that I make where it's like, hey, here's my story, right? Here's how I went from here to here. Here's all the things I learned along the way. Like, yeah, that got a decent amount of reach. I didn't expect it to go viral, but like every person that saw that, now they know my story, right? And now there's like a deeper connection built there and so that's what I think people need to start to really optimize for more of. And it's so hard because you can't see that, right? That's not a number on the screen. How deep your bond is with someone else, that's something that's a little bit more intuitive to the, the creator, to, to have that awareness, to like be able to see that. And so that's something that I, I like to do is not just like, you know, I sometimes I kind of, uh, what's the word? Like I'll knock on these videos where it's like people just, you know, they'll, they'll put their kind of face and like text over the screen and like, that's it. There's nothing wrong with those videos. I make those videos all the time. They're super easy to make. And like, yeah, they get a, they get a lot of reach. They'll get a lot of followers, but 
that's what that video is designed to do, right? That video is not really connecting, right? Uh, like you're, you don't feel any more connected to me after that video, right? And so it's kind of a, a balance between the two for me. Yes, I, I want to, you know, continue to grow, make these videos where like my account's growing, I'm giving myself chances of going viral, but I also want to think about the, you know, I'll call it like the bottom funnel, right? Where I'm actually building that like deeper, deeper connection. Um, so that's really like the, the, the two sides of the coin that I think about. I'm, I was shaking my head like an idiot for the last like two minutes there. Cause it's the exact same way that I process it like, completely and the way that I approach it. So like hearing all that and, and the way that you approach content, like, it's all from the way that I see it, is like a longer time horizon, seeing the end in mind and understanding that every piece of content yep. plays a role. And I always say like, I view each piece of content I ever make for myself or help clients with as investments, as a lar- as part of a larger portfolio, right? So it's like, you understand that mm. each stock you invest in or each investment ha- plays a role in the overall portfolio. So you don't get too obsessed over one little things and you understand that things can have different roles in all of that. So how did you, or who do you learn from? Or how did you learn to have this approach? Cause I would say it's wildly rare on social when everyone's just chasing metrics. Where did you obtain this perspective? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And I don't, uh, I don't know if I have like a, a pinpoint answer for it. I think something that's helpful is like when I first got on TikTok, I wasn't necessarily selling something. Right. And I think like that had to do, had to do a lot with it. Like I was just, okay, I'm just going to put out like helpful stuff. Um, I'm just going to put out like super valuable stuff and try to like attract the right people to me. So I think coming in with that mindset really helped me and just kind of being in like that marketing world for a while, yeah. um, you know, having done YouTube ads and, and Facebook ads and realizing that like, okay, when you create something that it like does put value out there first, you often see like a better return from it. Um, so I kind of think that there was never like this one moment that like kind of clicked for me where I needed to do that. It was more of like a gradual process. Yeah. And- do you deal with any hate comments or any like trolls on, on TikTok at all? Yeah, occasionally. Um, not a ton. I wouldn't say I, I wouldn't say I have a ton. Like I definitely see other accounts that have like yeah. a lot more. Uh, but yeah, you you do get those from time to time. And it's just one of those things where it's like, whatever, you know, you you ignore it and move on, or you even just like like their comment or respond to it, but like it stuff doesn't really bother me. Um, but yeah, I, I don't see it too much. What was that one video that you did that was that was like, it was, wasn't it like respond, how to respond to a yeah. troll or whatever? That was okay. one of my favorite videos you ever made. Can you walk through that? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's basically like how to turn a negative into a, a positive in this situation, right? Because as you're growing, you will get people that dislike you, uh, especially if you're, you're a polarizing person and like you will get those hate comments, but at the same time, you'll have the complete opposite uh, side of the spectrum where you have people that are like absolutely love you, right? They'll, they'll die for you. They're like your super, super close followers. And so what I like to do is like, you get a hate comment, you take that and you pin it. And then what happens is a couple of things. One, this kind of shows that like, okay, I'm not like emotionally insecure and I'm going to go delete all my hate comments. It's kind of like a, oh, like, you know, I don't, I don't give a, you know, F what you think about me. Right. So one, you pin it. And then two, what happens is all of the people on the other side of the spectrum are going to hop in and like defend you. So now you kind of get like, one, you're getting almost like these arguments in the in the comments, and it's just gonna it's only gonna help to push your video out even more, right? So you take this like negative hate comment and you turn it into a way to uh, one show people that you don't really care what people think of you, what people say, and two, you get people to come in and like support you, help you, and you're also getting the video to get pushed out even more. That's so bomb! I remember seeing that. I was like, that is damn genius. I'm gonna try that. That is like the ultimate. Trump card for trolls. You're just like, yeah. here you go, do your thing. And it's it, like, it's so funny. And I've had a, and, and cause you will find once you start to get any amount of traction on social, like there are people with way too much time on their hands and they love to, to leave hate comments. Like some of the stuff you get on, once you, I'm sure you've already seen some on YouTube, but once you get on there more, people will go hard in the comment section, I think largely because they're watching on a computer. So they'll actually type it all out. But I've gotten no YouTube is worse. YouTube's way worse than TikTok. So like I, we were talking about this a little bit uh, off air before we started filming. But like I want to start getting on YouTube more. Up to this point, I've just done a lot of like repurposing my TikToks as reels, and like I don't really look at the metrics very much or comments ever. But like every every once in a while, I'll pop into YouTube, be like, oh, how's how's my channel doing, right? For right now, it's kind of an afterthought. And I'll look at some of these reels, the ones that like get a ton of views, and like 
people are nasty on YouTube. It's like TikTok, I don't really see that as much, but yeah, YouTube, it's it's something else. It is weird, man. And so it, the biggest problem that I had is early on in my YouTube career, I would, because I, I love to have conversations with people, even especially people who disagree with me. I actually like thoroughly enjoy that. So I would entertain some of them. And it's actually so funny that if you just go like the, the Gary Vee route and it's like ultimate compassion, usually people... Like they tire themselves out because usually yeah. it's not you. It's an extension of something going on in their own life. And you're just an outlet that they saw that they could go off on. So you do have to approach it with two things like compassion for the other person. And then also compassion for yourself, understanding that it has so little to do with you, but that thing alone mm -hmm. allows or stops people from, from pursuing social. So I think your strategy to deal with them is absolutely genius. Cause it kind of like just completely takes away the power. Yeah. I, I, um, I actually think so like what you mentioned about, you know, people not wanting to pursue social because of these hate comments and these trolls. I think there, there might be a, a piece of it in there, but I also think a lot of it comes from actually what the people closest to you yes. think, right? Because it's easy for like, oh, random user 447 said, Mike, you stink. <laughs> like, all right, whatever. Um, but if it's like you get that message from like your buddy in college and he's like, bro, what the hell is this? Like that is what stings a little bit more right. for a lot of people. Um, so I actually think that is one of the, like the biggest hurdles to get over. And I'm, I'm curious to hear how you handled this and like what your story was for like yeah. getting started. But for me, a big portion of it, um, and I'm not going to say that this was like premeditated. It kind of was just was like a, a, a good storm for this. But like one, I started on TikTok, which is more of like, Bro, you could be on TikTok for like three months and you know, most most people don't even know, right? As opposed to like Instagram, it's like you have everybody that you ever known is right there, right? Versus TikTok, it's like, oh, people people aren't even gonna find you till like you've already grown, which is super helpful. Um, that was one thing. And two, I just like moved to a new country and I was in a completely new setting around an entirely new group of people. Um, so like both of those elements really allowed me to just go like all in to like okay i'm i'm creating content but i'm curious what that what that process was like for you yeah that's, you made some great points there too and that's that's i think one of the best things with tiktok and one of the things i say whenever my friends are worried about that is like you could do it and there's even settings there where you can not show it to your contacts so you can even delay how long it gets to the people that you know so because I, I have a bunch of tiktoks that i made just for like trials and experimentation that have like 15 20 000 followers that no one knows that i have from, for me personally mm -hmm. so that's a super cool thing but I, I definitely dealt with that because I started in all of this stuff when everyone was in, in like peak still caring mode and still very connected. Like I think I started most of my stuff when I was in like second or third year university when people still really care about where they're going to the bar that night and, and what person wore this that night. So yeah. I, my first thing was uh, YouTube and podcasting. So you would not believe how many times I got roasted as the podcast guy. And like, they said that to me as, as a chirp. And I think you have to understand that why are you doing this? And for me, it was always bigger than the people who were saying any of those things. And you also have to understand that like everybody has the opinion that they do because of what they've been subjected to up to this point. So like even when my close friends would dog on me, you got to think about like, why would they do that? It's because of the close perspective that they have. And there's probably something deeper right. that they're not dealing with or that they wish they could deal with, etc. So it, it really came full circle. And I've always been very fortunate where I've never cared that much about what people thought. But it definitely came full circle because randomly uh, I got reached out to by a bunch of media news outlets because my buddy who runs a big blog is very connected with, uh, with uh, blogs that are trying to write about like creators and stuff. So he connected one with me from the U.S. news, uh, the national news, about students that were using social media and online businesses to pay off their student loans. And I had happened to pay off my entire student loans with my YouTube channel and my business. So I was interviewed in US News and then it got picked up by, so that was an online outlet, but then it got picked up by the Canadian National News and they asked me to come on the live TV. So like literally like the national news in all of Canada that was going right to people's TVs, I was on for like 10 minutes straight. It was crazy, man. And so I've never had a higher viewed story in my entire life than from that because it was all people I knew sharing it. And you wouldn't even believe some of my best friends replied back to that or when I saw them in person and said, I'm not going to lie, man. We used to roast you like crazy. We used to say everything you were doing was so stupid. And I'm so glad that you're now here and made me look dumb. 
So it's like, you, you have to understand that's just part of the process. And I would yeah. use it as fuel when I was like back then, but it doesn't even really matter because if you're doing it for reasons for yourself, you, you can't lose because at the end of the day, you either you get there or you don't, but you know that you did everything you could to try. So that was my story with it. I'm sure I still get roasted all the time now, but there's a little less merit to their roasts. Good for you, man. That, that takes some uh, serious strength to be able to like persevere through that. Yeah, it was funny. And people just, I guess largely it was, it was, uh, it was a multitude of situations, but people do love to share their opinion. And, and I think one of the, and this actually, this perfectly segues into something I wanted to ask you about. I was at this party uh, with people who I knew, and then they were, like, someone was taking a picture or something like that. It was, and, and this girl was like, oh, sorry, Ben, we don't all feel the need to document our entire lives. And I was like, like, it was just such a, it was out of nowhere and like really out of left field. And so I wanted to ask you personally about, like, have you had any experiences with the people that you know, like, physically saying anything to you? Or has it usually been more in the background? Yeah, not not really right now. Um, one, like, I'm I'm in Colombia right now. So, like, yeah, true. I, I don't have a lot of, like, face-to-face with, like, kind of, like, the random person from high school here and there. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I don't yeah. really have that anymore. Um, and like the people that I do see, like when I go home, for example, I'm, I'm, uh, traveling back to the States next week. I go to Miami Sweet. and I go back nice. to Philadelphia, which is where I'm from I'm going to Austin for a little bit, just kind of hopping around. Um, but like when I go back, I will, you know, of course see friends and, and family, but it'll be more like people that I choose to see, you know what I mean? Uh, so no, I haven't really run into that much at all. Have you had any friends? even random people that you just know reach out to you looking for help in terms of yes. getting into this world? Yes. Yep. And how definitely. do you handle that? Uh, it's kind of a case by case situation. It really depends on like what they need, what they're looking for, how close we are. Um, yeah, super, super case by case. But like, yeah, a lot of people will just be like, you know, especially if they reach out in the right way where they're like, Mike, like I'm inspired by what you're doing. Like, you know, I, I love what you're doing here, X, Y, Z. Like, here's my situation. I'm wondering what your thoughts are. And of course, to the point, you know, you can't always say yes to the like, hey, pick your brain calls. Like, <laughs> you know, cause I, I would be doing five a day. Um, but there are some cases where it's like, yeah, you know what? Like we were super close in, in college and like, you know, you're, you're a good friend and I love the way you approached it. Yeah, like, let's talk about it. Yeah, I, so I love that. Cause I'm the same way. If, if if there's merit, there's reason, and I can see that they're actually serious, then then I'll do it. But I've had some funny ones where it was people that I knew didn't like me, and they were the most vocal about everything that I was doing being stupid. And then the, the, when they needed help for their for their brand, they started during COVID or for uh, trying to get a remote job because they they lost their job. Then they're like in my ear, and I just I just can't stand like the fakeness of it. Um, mm-hmm. have, have you had anything like that, or, or if just just real stuff? Uh, a little bit, not not a ton, but I've had some like. I've had people ask me for like a job that I'm like not really that close with. And it's like, I don't don't know about that. Um, One, one thing I do want to add, I had a conversation with another buddy about this. Like we were talking about the same situation and saying how like, there's really no good way to respond to Mm -hmm. some of these asks. Like, especially the ones where, you know, you're going to say no, like, you know, it's like, Hey, like, I appreciate you reaching out, but like, I don't think this is a good fit or like, it's not a good time or like, just like however you want to word it, like saying no, there's no good way to do it because like that person is for some reason always feels like entitled to your time. Um, and like, it always creates more friction. And so like what we talked about is just like, just deleting those and like not even responding because like, it, it kind of seems like a cop out in some ways, but then most of the time that person's just like, okay, they're a super busy person. Like they're not getting back. And so like, I don't know if you, if you found a good way to like say no to those situations. Yeah, man, that is, you're, 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 you're bringing up gems here. So I appreciate that. But for that specific scenario, I, this is what I found so funny because Gary Vee, everyone preaches to go, oh, get back to everyone and give free value. But I found that the people that were the most eager for free value were never going to buy from you anyways. And they, they, like, they don't value your time because you gave it away for right. free. And so, and then the ones that, say you don't get back to them and they get angry over it, they were never going to be a client anyway. So I really differentiated for myself and I dramatically slowed how many I used to, I get back to I used to spend hours a week going through and replying to every single person with a voice note. And I used to say that in all my YouTube videos. So I would get more and more and more, but then I found that 
it wasn't moving my biz, my business at all. And oftentimes I would also find that I would re- reply back to these people and they often wouldn't even follow me. Like even after I did that. So it's just like, it, I just wasn't seeing the ROI and I was just seeing that there are other ways where the people who are serious can get in contact with me. And because they're yeah. serious about that time, they're going to get way more from it. It's going to help everyone involved. A, a way that yeah. I deal with podcast outreach because a ton of people will be like, oh, come on my podcast because everyone starts a podcast and then they want to get their first guests. I always say I'll be your 21st episode. So that's a great that's way cool. to get through because the I have probably said that to about 50 to 60 people and I've only done three. So that goes to show you that that many people fell off. And I was like, so that's the perfect way because it's a motivator. Like, I would love to be in your show. I'm, I'm honored to p- even be a thought, but I want to be your 21st episode. So go ahead, hit me after the 20th and I'll come on. I like that a lot. It's worked, like man. It's freed up a ton of time. I like that a ton. What like what I've realized too with a lot of Instagram DMs, because that's where a lot of people reach out to me, because I'm, you know, most most uh, putting on content on TikTok and like the Instagram's linked up. That's like the easiest way to message you. And like I'll get so many people that just met like message me things that are like, yo, hook me up with that job, or just like little stuff like that where it's like Dude, like you could have just clicked the link and then like applied and it's like super easy to do it there. And so like a lot of those, I just won't answer because I know like, okay, this person's not serious because if they were serious, they would have just gone to my website and like done the thing as opposed to like asking me like, hey, how do I do the thing? It's like, you you just have to click two buttons. Um, So I'll get so many people that will like reach out about things that that initial message will just be a signal to me that like this person, I don't really want to work with either way because like, if they couldn't figure out how to get to that point, then it's like, it's not a good fit. Yeah. And is it so true in initial outreach? And I've also found this with employees, like, you know, right away, whether someone's like a stud or not, like it, it very often right. is not the case where they become a stud later. Usually it's very clear and obvious the type of person they are, the ambition that they have and the grit that they have. And I think the most under utilized skill or, or maybe the one in the shortest supply is a like common sense and the ability to just figure things out, like basic things. Right. And, and I, it always blows my mind how often this is the case when we live in a world with Google and YouTube. Like you don't even have to be that resourceful to find the answer. It's like two seconds away. Yeah. No, I, there should I, be a course on Googling. <laughs> I hear you on that for sure. And, and you brought up, uh, you know, being able to, to see that in, in employees. I'm, I'm curious to learn a little bit more about like your agency, how that's structured, like uh, the employees that you have. Um, Cause you know, I don't know too much about your agency, but yeah. we might have something that's like kind of comparable where you're doing something on YouTube, I'm doing something on TikTok. So yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about like exactly what you guys do and the structure too. Yeah, absolutely, man. And, and I would definitely throw that back at you because I'd love to, to learn from your systems too. But for us, what we really preach is a social first approach to everything. So I, my role within the agency is more of like the top level st- I would say I'm like the CEO of the of our client's content, essentially. So like I do long-term strategy. Uh, I go from their goals and then work backwards from typically a YouTube perspective, saying like, hey, here are the different bets that we're going to make when it comes to videos. And then here's where I think it's going to take us. Why we went with YouTube is because once you get pretty good at YouTube, which we are definitely there, views are wildly predictable. So I can basically confidently say you're going to get X amount of views within a range every single month. And then we work backwards from there saying like, okay, so if you had that many targeted leads, which all YouTube views are, how many do you typically close? Right? And then they're like, oh, a ton. And then it's like, okay, so then how much is that worth to you? And then we go from there. So the process that we have is we only typically work with high ticket info product sellers and then SaaS companies. So then I have a team of editors that have been taught with like our education systems in terms of like how to edit specifically for YouTube. And then we also have a thumbnail designer who makes everyone's thumbnails that is, again, like YouTube driven. So that's what we're really pitching is the fact that you go do this yourself, but you're not going to get nearly as much success and you're not going to have the time to to grow your business or run your business effectively. So it's a very uh, like there's there's not I don't even know another agency that does this really. I'm sure they are out there, but I've never come across one. Uh, But that's how we handle it. We we provide our our editors the, uh, the coaching and then we also provide some coaching for the creators on the other side. So usually it will be a representative from the brand or if it's an info product seller, it will be them because they want to grow their own brand. But occasionally we will try to source creators for companies if they don't have anybody who can actually make this stuff because that can be obviously a huge hurdle, which which you know, but that's that's the the route that we take. I hope that made sense. Yeah, definitely. And then in terms of the 
the actual content, right? The like, hey, here's the video idea. Here's how you should structure it. Here's the framework. Framework. Yeah. Here's the hook. Uh, is that something that like your agency helps to provide, or do you tell them like, hey, you're making four videos this month. Here are the four topics. Um, like, like, where does that fall? That's a great question. So that's that's I would say is our true biggest differentiator is that we do provide the strategy, and so um, nice. it, because we know YouTube so well, we can really formulate a strategy very specific to each client's goals. And so for a lot of um, SaaS products and even info product sellers, a lot of their uh, like sales driven content is going to be based on search engine optimization. And there are enough tools out there where you can really see how many, like the ton of traffic that's out there. And then if you do things the right way, you're, you're going to rank there. And then if the video is solid there, it's going to perform. So typically I will break down how much of their strategy is going to be put towards search engine optimization, evergreen content, and then how much is going to be more browse and suggested based content and really trying to equate the two based on what their primary goals are. Like, are they trying to build a community here and get as large as possible? Or are they very, very sales driven? And then I'll usually equate that out to a number of saying like, maybe it's 80, 20 or 50, 50, et cetera. And so why we do it like that is because the understanding the goals makes my job way easier. But a lot of people don't know that they obsess over search terms for, for YouTube. That's fantastic for this element. But in terms of growing an audience, search traffic is not great. It is, it is very predictable, but it will almost never go viral. And so that's why you can look at channels like Think Media. And I love Think Media, but people like v look at them as like the be all end all success when it comes to, um, when it comes to YouTube, but their channel is always going after search terms. And so if you go look at their performance of their videos, you will see a wild fluctuation in the traffic that they receive because they're taking that approach. Because a lot of people aren't aware that 80% plus of the views on YouTube in total come from YouTube suggesting your content in browse and suggested. And if you make a video targeting a keyword, it will almost never also perform in browse and suggested. So it's very much a trade off of like picking okay, what's our focus here. And you can't try to do both because if you try to do both, you'll get neither. So it really comes down to figuring out what they want, what they need, and then going to fill that gap. And then how I see these opportunities is I've just been studying YouTube for like this point, six to seven years. And so I will go in and see underserved areas try to build up the ranking authority within a specific niche and then go after the bigger fish. So it's very much a, a layered process. Right. That's super interesting, man. That's super interesting. And like, I'm so happy that we're having this conversation right now because I'm, I'm at that point where like, I've known it for a while that I need to get on YouTube. I need to start putting more focus there. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of doing this like half ass approach right now. where like, we're putting out content there. We're, we're putting out some YouTube shorts from TikTok, and like, we're taking my podcast just like this from Riverside. We're chopping it up into some clips, putting on YouTube, but like, it's not a real strategy, right? It's just kind of like, it's just, we're just putting things out there and they're getting like 15, 20 views. Um, so I know I'm going to have to revisit it at some point and just, just get consistent and just make that commitment. Like, Hey, one video a week, whatever it is, let's get yeah, going. Man. And so just, I think this would be a fun little exercise. So I'm going to, I'm going to do it right now with you. And then I want to hear about your business. But for example, like a lot of people that they, they take the exact same approach to YouTube and then they don't grow and they're frustrated why they don't grow. So you can still, like the thing is, it's not even necessarily you need to do a change in output, you need to do a change in content packaging. So like I'm looking at your channel right now and Creator Money is your show obviously and I love that you're breaking it up into clips. But for this right here, how to bring digital products to life, that's, that's not even a bad title, but the thumbnail doesn't help to enhance the anticipation or the intrigue in that video specifically. So like how I would, would tweak that is to make it all about the potential viewer and not about you or your show at all. Like I would totally differentiate it and make it right. all about the change that would get from, that they'd get from this piece of content. So for example, like on our most recent podcast where we had Ed from Film Booth on, I'm not even in the thumbnail. The only person who's in the thumbnail is him and then the entire title of the video, which is a big long form podcast, and the thumbnail is totally like a standalone piece of content in a way that like, how can we shape this in the way that is the most intriguing as a standalone piece of content? So for example, we talked about, we talked at length for about YouTube, but I made the title of the, of the video or the, the episode, the obvious strategy that separates great YouTubers. And why we did that is because now this is a podcast episode, but that would now also perform well as a standalone video on YouTube. And so even if you're, you're doing podcasts, you have to approach each piece of content as a standalone piece of content specifically for YouTube. And then we also, a big huge mistake people make is that they just regurgitate what they've already said in the title in the thumbnail. And that is just wasted opportunity and wasted real estate. 
for example, of what we did there is we had a totally standalone thumbnail where we have a metrics graph of like YouTube views and a huge spike of views. And then we say strategy change. And this, what the secret there is that's now a complementary title and thumbnail, which dramatically increases the chances that that will work. So for, for your stuff, let me see here. So like how to bring digital product life. So Go ahead. For, for some of your, for some of your, I think we got a, a lag and we're breaking up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, no um, for some of your content, do you take, will you take like clips like this? you know, from, from podcasts like this and make, you know, maybe a three minute, five minute, 10 minute video and post that on YouTube and that stuff will perform. It can. So it all comes down to content packaging. And so the best place to learn is to go look at some of the podcasts that are doing this so well. And you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. You'll see that like it's, it, they'll take whatever is the most compelling hook point from that piece of content. And then they'll center all the packaging around that because once they get in, like that's the biggest part. And the better you do this, the higher or the stronger the anchor is. And so a lot of people think like, oh, well, all clicks are made equal. Not at all. If you're really good at this, people will have such investment in the potential outcome or they'll be so intrigued that they'll give you more time. So like oftentimes people are like, oh, my watch time was low. Um, and so like they think it's all the content. Sometimes it could be you just didn't get them, like didn't get them peaked interest enough, if that makes sense. Right. Do you tee up those moments in your podcast where you're like, oh, I'm gonna like try to tee this up where like, I know that this is gonna be a hook that's gonna translate well to YouTube now and that's gonna be like a, one of the content packages. Do you like kind of go into an episode with some of those outlined? Definitely, so uh, I'm sure you've already read this book, but if you haven't, I strongly recommend it. It's called Hook Points. And so he- I haven't, re I haven't read it. Definitely recommend it, pick that up. It, it, Cause so he, it's something that we were, we were indirectly doing, but now it's actually conscious practice. And so he used to run a bunch of media things that he blew up and he used to run an interview show. So then he would think backwards from the questions that he was going to ask or give the interviewer to ask based on what is the clip that's going to come from this question. And he would always think mm. like clip first. And that is the ultimate hack for growing a podcast specifically is like, how do you cover topics uh, that, that will gr create great hook points that you can make content around. And so if you want examples of who's doing this well, Go look at Joe Rogan's uh, the channel. Go look at impulsive clips. And you'll see these four elements, they're done over and over and over again. They're just not easy to do. But it's almost like you're taking off a blindfold once you see it. And, and then everything becomes so clear and you're like, wow, I can't believe I was sending out my content before like this and anyone clicked it. Like once, once you see that, you're like, oh, this is so obvious. I love that. Yeah, because right now, to be honest, YouTube, like I mentioned, it's an afterthought and like, how I do my podcast, there is no, like I don't have those like, oh, I'm gonna tee this up so I know it's gonna be a YouTube. And like you mentioned our, our thumbnails and like the editing and like that's something I don't even touch. So like I'll film a podcast and like it's done for me, right? I don't post it, I don't clip it up, I don't do the descriptions, I don't even like, like you were just reading through some of my videos and I'm like, I couldn't tell you the <laughs> name of the last five videos that we posted because it's an afterthought. Yeah. Um, and I know it's something that like, where your attention grows, you know, those things will grow. And like, I know I just gotta get, I gotta allocate the time to, to focus up and like take it more seriously. It's just a matter of like, when does that point come for yeah. me? And I know it's soon. And honestly, like you can get a lot with a little tweak. So like I'm looking at your, your thumbnails right now and I'm sure a ton of people listening to this have shows and they're probably doing the same thing because it can be a lot of work. But if you can get someone who has this yeah. skill set, it, it can really flow very quickly. So I'm looking at your most recent clip from, um, I'll go with this one. So from three days ago, and it's from a podcast of yours and you say what what to do if you're feeling stuck and then there's a there's you and then the guest and then in small yeah. text is what to do if you're feeling stuck again so for me that's pure wasted real estate plus you also have to do what i call the blink test and so essentially if, if a title and a thumbnail can't communicate its intended purpose in one second after blinking you can't expect someone who's scrolling to stop so you so you got you have right. to maximize the how can we do this and then for here i actually love the the title of that what to do if you're feeling stuck but the visual doesn't amplify the intrigue that that title would create, right? So it's like for a way better thumbnail, I probably wouldn't even have either of you in there. And it would be like, it was just the first example off the top of my head. It would be like a before and after. So before would be someone like lazy in bed and then after would be someone working out, right? Like that would be way more impactful than just you, yeah. you guys standing there. Do you know what I mean? I completely hear you. And like it, this, what's awesome is like, there's this whole world of like YouTube thumbnails and like, I'm it's sure you're, you're like, that's your, that's your world, yeah. right? For me, this is like, whoa, I don't know this world at all. And, and like I mentioned, like I'll film a podcast and like that just goes to like my virtual assistants and like they just put on YouTube, yeah. right? And there's, there's 
we don't put any thought into it. Um, but it's so interesting. I like how you're right. Small little tweaks like that. Like I don't even have to change the actual no. clip. Like that could, you know, 10 X the, the number of views that we easily. Get. And like 10 X might, may even be a cautious estimate because these things also all compound and YouTube's very much authority driven. So mm -hmm. once you get some solid data, they're going to give you more and more chances. And so why people com complain about YouTube so much is because like, just like on TikTok, the hook is everything. That's, that's, that's the content packaging. There's just one thing you got to get right. On YouTube, you right. need to get the title, the thumbnail, and the hook right. That's the content packaging. So right there, it's exponentially more difficult because if you don't get all three of those things together, the chances of that clip or video doing well goes down dramatically. When, when you talk about the hook on YouTube, right? Like I'm super familiar with like what a hook is, of course. Uh, but coming from the TikTok world and the ads world, right? We think of hooks being like super quick. Yeah. On YouTube, is that hook like longer, right? Is that hook like 20 seconds or is that still like, oh, that's the first two and a half seconds. Like how do you, what do you consider a hook on YouTube? Great question. You definitely have a far longer runway on YouTube than on any other okay. platform. But in terms of how long they'll give you, that comes down to the packaging. Like how primed are they and how badly do they want this? And you can get some examples of this when you go look at say, like a lot of Joe Rogan's clips. The title and the thumbnail are wildly intriguing and they're very, very effective. Even though they're, they're simple in design, the, the concepts that are covered are wildly fascinating and intriguing. And typically like they won't even get to the meat of why people clicked it until they're like seven minutes in, but people are still glad they clicked it. So it's totally yeah. about that anchoring of like, how well did we do this? And Joe Rogan's guy has been doing this for since he started. And like, that's, that's a great channel to study and such a good case study. So for like a lot of our podcasting clients, we literally like, we just tell you like, this is a proven formula. There's a reason why everyone copies Joe Rogan because it works. Bro, that's super interesting. And I, I do think I need to, uh, to invest a little bit more into someone that is like very knowledgeable in YouTube uh, or, you know, potentially link up with, with your agency. We could talk uh, a little bit more about 100%, that. percent. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then like having that mind for it helps out tremendously, but I, I just talked for so long. I want to hear about how you guys structure everything at, uh, at brands, me creators. Yeah. So on the, I guess the, uh, you know, how, how our team is structured, uh, we're pretty small right now. Core team is just myself, uh, partner name's Brittany. She's based in the U S and then we have three employees that are in the Philippines. Um, and then a couple other people who are like more like contractor roles. So I like, I have a video editor that I work with sales guy that I work with. Um, but then how our, our process works with brands, essentially a brand will come on board. They'll say, Hey Mike, we want someone, we want, we want TikTok, right? That's what they come to me with is like, they don't really know what everything involves, but like, we know we need to be on TikTok. That's what we want. Like, how do we get there? And so, um, what typically happens is we figure out a little bit more about the brand, who they're looking for in a content creator. We'll get that super clear. And then we go out there and we start to find this person. I blast it on TikTok, blast it to my whole network across Facebook, Discord, everywhere. And we'll get tons of creators apply. Uh, we share all those applications directly with the brand. They'll go through and they kind of highlight ones that maybe they're interested in. Maybe uh, they'll highlight in red ones who are like, all right, we're not interested at all. And then we'll have a conversation maybe with their, like, their top three content creators. Um, some things I want to bring up now, some, I guess, like maybe misnomers. I really think that some of the best partnerships are formed with smaller content creators. Um, a lot of brands come in and they want this like star, right? They want someone who's like, of course, if they have the budget for it. Um, but we've actually seen a lot of those partnerships not end up very working out very well because when you work with a content creator who's, who's kind of already made it, they basically just see this as a check, right? Like mm -hmm. they don't, they don't have too many ties as opposed to, okay, now you're going to start working with a content creator who maybe they have uh, 10,000 followers. They got a small YouTube channel, whatever. And they're doing this part time. They still have another job. Now you partner up with them and that's their ticket out of their job into this whole other world. Now they're like, True. they're like, I'm in, right? My back's against the wall. Like, what do I got to do? Oh, you need five extra videos. They're done by tomorrow. Right? So like, we see those partnerships work out really well. Um, kind of just a, a, a tangent I wanted to throw in there. No, oh, that's huge, man. That's massive. Um, but then, yeah, that's, that's kind of the first piece, right? It's like finding the person. Uh, then it's about the, the strategy, right? Okay, so we found, the, we found the person and we like to find someone who's like, they've already had experience on TikTok, right? We're not hiring like an actor on Fiverr or whatever because we want someone who's like, <laughs> they're bringing 
strategy to the table, right? I don't want the strategy to just fall on me and my team, right? I want the brand involved in the strategy. I want the creator to, to start bringing strategy to the table as well. Um, but we'll sit down, we'll have a meeting between all of us. And it's actually pretty cool because this, the kind of these puzzle pieces have just come together recently, but like starting to notice that the strategy that we want to implement is like somewhat similar across all brands, like regardless of the niche, of course, there's going to be differences here and there. Uh, but a lot of like the pillars of what we do, I'm starting to see like, oh, there's kind of a, a pattern here. So like there's a lot of Amazing. videos that we will implement, right? Let's say we're doing 30 videos a month. So with every brand, we're going to do like a handful that are going to be storytelling videos, right? And of course, that's going to look different for every brand. There's going to be a handful of videos where we want to make them somewhat polarizing or like the controversial videos, right? So we have all of our brands um, kind of go through a process where it's like, hey, think of something that you know 50% of your audience is not going to agree with, right? And the other 50% is going to agree with, right? What does that look like for your brand? Another thing we like to do with all brands is to create a villain, right? It's along the same, along the same lines of like the polarizing or like the controversial, but like instead of just thinking, okay, here's everything that our brand is about. This is us. Start to identify those things that we're not, right? For example, mm. if you're like a eco-friendly, sustainable business, whatever, you're not those like toxic chemical products, right? Or for example, like uh, the one that comes to mind is I have this one client that's in the, the hair care space, right? And they make this dye, they make a ton of different products, but one of their products is like dye for your hairs and it's supposedly like actually healthy for your hair. So like they villainize box dye, right? And so like creating that villain and it, it creates these, um, it creates this dynamic. It's like this like tribalism where it's like, are you with us or are you not, right? Like which team are you on? Are you, are you team the enemy or team us? And so like, that's one style of video that we'll do. And so like, we'll just have these, these handful of styles that that's typically where we'll start off with the brand. So, Hey, we got like these five different styles. Let's make a bunch of them. And then it's like an optimization process, probably similar to how it is on YouTube. You, you go through, you see, okay, here are the 30 videos we made. These 12 flopped. Let's stop doing those. These did okay. These crushed it. Why did they crush it? Okay. Let's do more of that. And so it's just like this continued process going forward of optimizing. That's so awesome, man. You dropped two like gold nuggets there. The first one that I can relate to personally is that like the level of investment that people have or creators have in a brand matters so much. And I've lived this personally. When I was just getting started on YouTube, there was a few brands that actually took me seriously. And now like I'm there, I'm one of, I'm each of those like two biggest affiliate. And at the time I had a tiny channel, but they didn't treat me like an afterthought. Whereas I reached out to every one of the brands for the sector that I was trying to work with. And I got brushed aside by almost all of them. And now I've made each of those companies like hundreds of thousands of dollars per year annually. And they paid, which they paid me almost nothing for because they took me seriously. So right. it's like people having that long-term vision with a creator and what they can be created is absolutely insane. I, I love that you mentioned that. And then the villain piece, that is absolutely genius. That's one of like the best sales things too, is like the fastest way to get your customers is to tell, tell people who's not your customer, right? And then they know to keep listening or if they're in the right place. So I, I absolutely love that you shared that, man. Yeah, man. It's uh, just one of those things that like, it, it doesn't always work with a brand, but I find that it's something that's like, it's pretty easy to kind of bring that piece through to every single brand. Because if you really sit down and think about it, you yeah. you maybe even do this without even noticing like a lot of times i'll do it in my content uh where i'll villainize like i do like facebook ads now sometimes because i see a lot of my clients coming over from facebook ads right so like, you can kind of villainize that i did one the other day where it's like uh brands will pay a social media manager eighty thousand dollars to twiddle their thumb but they won't pay a uh, content creator three grand a month right so like finding That's those cool. things that you can like and it doesn't have to be this like character that you villainize right it can be an idea it can be a product it can be anything um but like creating those stances right drawing mm. that line in the sand of like hey i'm not that like i don't like that and like this is us over here that's so good yeah i think there's so many ways you get creative and incorporate those elements that will be successful into whatever you're talking about and one of the things that you talked about was like the whole point of controversy or, be, or being polarizing and so for one of my uh, clients that I, I create tiktok content for uh they're one of my uh, favorite partners, they're, they're Flick. They're a, a whole suite of uh, um, Instagram tools specifically, and then they're expanding out into TikTok and stuff like that. But we just made a video just talking about how uh, JT Barnett, who's a, I'm pretty sure you're boys with him, right? Yeah, I know who, I know who JT is. Yeah. We've had a uh, yeah. talk before. Yeah, yeah. So he, uh, he, he did a, a like he roasts Instagram all the time, like rightly or wrongly, he roasts Instagram. And then he did a collaboration with creators. 
uh, the, like Instagram creators page. And so then we made a video about that for like on flick and it is by far our most viewed video just because it was somewhat controversial. Like everyone felt entitled to share their opinion on yeah. Instagram, on like everything. It was just, it goes to show you that it is so true. If you just provide anything that's even slightly polarizing, it's going to travel. It's because like, yeah, if people one, if they feel like associated with it and if there's also the people who have that same feeling of association, but on the other side, it's mm. just a snowball because then you're getting like people disagreeing in the comments and it's like, it's continues to bring people back to that same video. Um, yeah, the, the polarizing stuff, it, it just works. But the, the one thing you do have to be aware of, especially in the world that I'm coming from, a lot of brands aren't ready for that, right? True. Like a lot of brands like can, they can kind of see that as bad. For, for example, I have this one client, they make, um, like affordable art that you can have, like, I mean, not necessarily like that, but something like similar to, to what I have back there. Something you can put on the wall, um, affordable, like canvases all made in the U S. And so we, we created a, an account for them and we do kind of like interior design tips. And one video was like, Hey, if you have, uh, or man, I'm kind of forgetting what it was, but it was basically like, if you have this in your house, like your, your house looks cheap or something along those lines, right? I forget exactly what the hook was. Um, and so many people found controversy in that. They're like, oh, I have that product in my house, right? It, was, it made fun of like the like live, live, laugh, love pillows or like the, uh, the little stuff like that. Um, and like there were so many people who like didn't like that. But then the video got half a million views, right? And it brought in a ton of traffic to the website and, and then a ton of customers. Um, but it's one of those things that like, as a brand, you have to be ready for that, right? If you do go the controversial route, you have to know that like, look, you're, you're going 50, 50 here, right? You're going to get a lot of people that like agree with you or, or they think it's funny or whatever, but then you're going to get the people that are like, oh, like you guys suck or, or whatever it is, right? It's those negative comments, but like having that, having both sides, like that is what fuels the fire. Yeah. I think so many creators and, and brands, they think like that too. They, they, they're so concerned about alienating anyone that they don't take a stand or, or post anything controversial because they're worried about that. But if, like, if you get 50% of the people that see your stuff to be wildly loyal, that is absolutely worth it. And you can grow a massive business off of that. Whereas if you mm -hmm. say that's nothing that's polarizing and you never grow an audience at all, your business doesn't move forward. So it's, I think, yeah. yeah, like riding that line is definitely a difficult thing to do of, of what's going too far. But I, I think most brands are gonna find success with it if, if done the right way. Yep, I like what you mentioned about like riding that, riding that line. Cause at the end of the day, like, I don't want to be like a, a controversial person. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure you don't want to either, but like, it's fine to say some stuff every once in a while that you know, like, oh, you know, some people that follow me, they're not going to like this, but like, that's fine, you know, because yeah. that's what I, that's what I believe. Um, so yeah. yeah, I do think there's like a, a certain line to watch. Yeah, again, it's that whole point we've talked about multiple times here is like every piece of content serves a purpose and then, and mm -hmm. that's one of the purposes that can be served. So we talked about growth briefly in this show too, but if, I know people are always looking for like those growth hacks. Do you have like any, like what's your top three growth hacks right now for growing on TikTok in 2022? Okay, it's a great question. Um, three, uh, I'll go more like uh, video styles. It's kind of what comes to mind. The first one that I'm really trying to do more of is storytelling content with quick videos in the background, right? It's one of those, not where like, I'm sitting there like like this talking to the camera, but it's me telling a story and like videos that are kind of coming through that go to tell that story. Like that stuff just seems to do so well on TikTok right now. And it's something that I know they want to push, right? They want to push more original content. Um, like they're kind of slowly going away from the, the trends. They told us they want more original content. They want less like reuse stuff. That's one that I would do. Two, something that I'm doing more and more of because it's easy and it's quick. But like when I travel or when I go somewhere, or when I'm in like a unique setting to just like film myself doing it. For example, like if I had uh, just my phone set up, boom, right here, filming me doing this podcast, it's, it's, this is maybe not a great example because it's not that engaging, but like for your example, the other week I'm at the beach in Columbia with like my mom and my girlfriend and like, we're filming some stuff of like me walking on the beach, like us eating dinner and like that, I can post as a, a video that's like 10 seconds and put some text on the screen that has something that's a little controversial. For example, I just did that the other day, right? I had a video of me walking on the beach 
and I put a uh, text over top and said, hey, we have seven available creator opportunities right now. One, this brand, two, this brand, three, this brand. That video took me about 35 seconds to make because like I just have those clips in my phone. So basically the point here is using content that you already have and creating that, um, that, that, uh, that bank of content. So I can just go back in my phone and look, okay, I have this video from when I was in uh, Mexico of me going on a hike. Let me put a seven second video there with like some, some text over top. Boom. I can put that out once a day for the rest of my life without having to ever film another video. Yeah. So that's another growth hack more along the lines of like how to put out more content with uh, doing less. And let me see if I can give you another tip. Um, the last one I would say is be quicker. Mm. So a lot of people, they'll make a video and it's like 37 seconds long. This is probably some of the most common advice I give to brands. I watch that video and I say, you can make that same exact video in 18 seconds saying everything you said, get rid of the white space, be quicker because like attention spans are getting faster and faster and faster. I don't know if it's the same on YouTube, but like if the lengths of the videos are shortening, um, but like that's just what it is, right? People, if, if it's not engaging, if it doesn't like tie people in, they're not gonna watch the whole thing. So like whatever you have to say, say it more concisely, say it quicker. That is such a good point. I think that's probably the fastest thing that you could do that is so easy, or I guess easy in theory, more difficult in execution, but you'll see results right away. And I'm someone who talks a lot and I always have. So I've always had to fight that within content as I always want to say it so much. So I've been trying to peel that back and actually a kind of unorthodox way that's helped me practice the whole brevity piece is tweeting because tweets are limited to a certain character count. So normally how I would write, I have to dramatically alter how I would write to fit it in one tweet. And it's also kind of transferred over to how I speak because I understand that time is precious and I got to communicate this point. That's good, bro. That's good. I'm, I'm actually not on Twitter. Um, You'd love Twitter, man. Twitter is unreal. Everyone tells me that it's just one of those things that like, I don't know if I want to pick up another thing. Yeah. True. Like it's, I'm at this point where I actually have it written down on this whiteboard behind me. It's like simplicity scales and I'm trying to do less because I got to this point in my business where like I was overwhelmed. I was trying to do way too many things. Um, We didn't even talk about this side of of my business yet, but like I have this, uh, the the agency is called Brands Meet Creators, right? Mm -hmm. And I've always done everything on the brand side. And there's just, just this huge opportunity on the content creator side. I get probably three DMs every day. Like, Mike, do you do like one-on-one coaching for creators? Like, Mike, like I want brand deals. Like, do you guys manage creators? Like, hey, do you have like a program here? So I just had so much demand on the content creator side. And I knew I was leaving money on the table by not offering anything there, not managing creators, not providing any you know help over there. So I did launch a, a program. It sold out in 48 hours. And I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. Um, but then what started to happen was like, there's starting to be too many things now. Now mm-hmm. it's like, I'm growing this program over here. Now I'm growing the agency. We're also working on building a platform. And like, there were just so many things going on. It was just mentally so draining. I had to take a step back and say, okay, let's go back to this one thing. Let's try to get this in place. Let's get it to a point where like, I'm not even involved in the process at all. Then let's jump to number two. And so like, that's, uh, you're not the first person that told me like that I would love Twitter. I like, I, I hear that so often for me, it's just another, it's a thing. It's like, it's it going to move the needle for me or is it going to be another like thing that just clogs up uh, space in my head right now? That is a great point. And something that I've struggled with too, there's so many parallels to our stories and also like our challenges, because that's one thing too, where I'm, I'm trying to subtract. I'm not, I'm not trying to add more things, but yeah. there's just so much opportunity in this space, especially once you get some wins, there's more and more opportunities find their way to you. But what I would say with Twitter is even if it's not from a direct business perspective, I would argue there's no better place to network with heavy hitters. Like there are people who actually know what they're doing and will inter- interact with you. And I only was taking serious TikTok serious, sorry, Twitter seriously for like a few weeks. And I got thrown in some circles because of the content I was making of people that I probably would have never met that were absolutely crushing it in different spaces. And so that was so cool and showed me the power of it where from a learning point of view, like that's probably the only place where you can go with the level of expertise that you have and you'll actually learn stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like I feel like, I feel like it's where like where people who are well-versed in this space, they go to learn. Like that's where I will actually go and read stuff. And then from a networking perspective, it's crazy the people that are there sharing stuff for free and that will be happy to interact with you. That's super interesting. That's super interesting. Like, man, you're making me think about it. Um, 
I don't know. It, so what I do is I'll just batch tweets. And so basically, like, you can turn – so I'm trying to go the, the other route. Like, I'll batch tweets typically, and then I'll be like, okay, well, what performed well? And then that might be a video I should make. Or you can take go either way too. But you could – like, right. everything you're saying in a – in a TikTok, like all your stuff could be tweets. Like literally every single one of them would be a great tweet if written correctly. And then a lot of them, the sequenced ones that you've made could be threads and threads work really, really well. So uh, like those, those travel really well. So it's definitely worth looking into, but I totally understand the, the need to prioritize things. So that's why I try not to spend too much time on there. Cause you will get sucked in. So I literally cap it. I'll be like, okay, I'm going on for like 15 minutes today and then I'm getting out. The, the other platform too is uh, LinkedIn. That's actually where I think I'm going next yes. because I've already, I've already like dabbled in there more and more. Like I, I put out like maybe a post a week, not really, probably less. But over the last month, I've put out maybe like four somewhere in that ballpark. And like I'm starting to see some people come from LinkedIn um, because for me, that's where a lot of like my Brand target really. client yeah. is, right? It's like the CMO of uh, you know some some brand or like the CEO or you know the head of social or whatever it is. Um, I just need to start really like developing those systems and like getting people that can help with that because, you know, as, as creators are, are and business owners, like our, our bandwidth is, is limited. Right. And so I know for me, it's like the, the, the absolute meat of this whole thing is like my TikTok content. So like that, that always has to come first for me. Um, and then it's like these other platforms, how can I take what I have and like create some type of spillover where, where maybe it is. Uh, I have someone on my team that's just like a, a Twitter ninja and they just take my TikToks and they're like, okay, how do I turn this into a TikTok for Mike? And like, boom, because, you know, maybe it can't be me in there 24 seven. Yeah. So it's just about figuring out like how to build those systems and like which one comes next. Yes. Uh, but for me, right, like right now, a lot of my focus is coming back to like the clients and like building better systems and more of like the, the fulfillment. Um, because I see a lot of these platforms like Twitter, LinkedIn, um, YouTube, it's like a lead gen source mm -hmm. at the end of the day, right? And so for me, the the bottleneck in the business right now is not lead gen. Like, like while we're, while we were on this call, I got a notification on my phone, like Slack notification, like you just got a, a booked Let's call. Go. So like th those things come yeah. in, right? And they they come in a lot from from TikTok. And so for me, the bottleneck is the fulfillment side mm -hmm. of the business and trying to do too many things. And so like, I kind of go back and forth of like, okay fulfillment dial it in right get things fixed and boom now it's like lead gen let's 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 you know uh pour gasoline on the fire and then okay something broke in the systems go back to the systems fix them and it's like this this constant back and forth but right now i'm i'm uh i'm kind of back in the in the business and less on the like putting out more content and more platforms no that makes total sense it's it's definitely a balancing act especially as an entrepreneur and a creator, you really have to pick yeah. pick where you, you pick your battles and, and, and take it that way. And I think I love the approach that you're taking where it's like, what's next? Because I think a lot of people, they'll take everything we said from this conversation and try to do it all at once, where I think you're way better right. served picking one of them, doing it right, building out a system where you can be, it can be part of it or someone else is completely running it. And then uh, you don't overwhelm yourself because when you try to take on all, all of them, you're going to do them, all of them ineffectively and you're going to get no results and be totally discouraged. Where had you invested in one, you would have broken through, gotten the results and it could have raised all the other, other all the other subsequent ships. So I uh, love that perspective. Yeah. Go ahead. That's a great, I want to, I want to reiterate that because like we have been talking about like a lot of different platforms, <laughs> all this different stuff. And like, it's super overwhelming for someone that's new, even super overwhelming for like me. Yes. And like, I love what you just said. It's like, okay, take one thing and go for it. And like, yeah, I know I, I could get on Twitter and LinkedIn and YouTube, but like in reality, if I take that extra hour that I would spend on Twitter, the extra hour on LinkedIn, the extra hour on YouTube and took those three hours and made an additional three hours worth of TikTok videos, that would get me 10 times the results. And so like, that's what I have to, that's what I have to do. Yeah, I think it's all <laughs> about prioritizing the, the outputs that bring you closest to your goals, right? And so I think that comes down yeah. to not only the decision of platform, but also the kind of content you're making, which we've talked about time and time again. And obviously you just reiterized that uh, TikTok is your bread and butter. So do you have any predictions yeah. for the evolution of TikTok? Cause I, st like, I think there's gonna be some big changes in the next year or two. Yeah, it's going to be super interesting. Like I do foresee at some point in the future, I don't know when, but like it almost has to decline the organic reach, right? I think it will at some point. I don't think it's going to get to the point where it's like, you know, it's it's dead, right? Like, I mean, 
At some point, yes, but I don't think we're anywhere anywhere near that. Um, but there will start to be, you know, more ads on the platform. The brands are going to bring over bigger budgets. Uh, that's just kind of the the life cycle of these things. I'm really hoping that TikTok goes a, a little bit more in the direction of YouTube versus like kind of what's happening to Instagram. Mm. Um, and what I really wonder is like, will TikTok start to go more in the direction of like a search engine almost or, or somewhat like evergreen? Um, I think that could be something that's extremely pivotal because right now, you know, you post a video and like, yeah, it could still get traction a month from now. Like that does happen, but like, it's nothing like YouTube where you post a video in a year, you know, a year later, that video is still bringing in views. Um, so I don't know what it's going to look like, you know, a couple, a couple of years from now, but what I do have a strong feeling about is like, we're still in the initial innings, right? I don't think this is something where it's like, Oh, uh, you know, TikTok is not one of the big name platforms, uh, 18 months from now. Like, I don't, I don't see that happening. Yeah. I have to agree with you. And I think why YouTube is such a mainstay and why it's still here is there's two reasons and you touched on both of them really. But the first one is their prioritization of creators. A lot of people don't know this, but, but they actually give away, they give away more of the money that they make from ads than they keep. They get, it's a 55, 45 split, which is absolutely insane. They prioritize creators that much. And I think that's why they've had the longevity and the loyalty that they do have from their creators. Yeah. And the second piece is that long content lifespan. Yeah, it's not just a year. Like it, I have videos from like three years ago that are st still bringing in views. And the even crazier thing is, even if a video has been dead for a very long time, you can go in and swap the, the packaging, the title and the thumbnail, and then it could get re-indexed and then do way better. And I have some videos on my channel where I've swapped the thumbnail like 10 times and finally something clicked. And that video that I made way back, like two years ago, is now getting an, a resurgence of traffic. So like that's not really possible anywhere else. So I would be crazy about TikTok and incorporating some ways to extend the content lifespan because then it would make it a no brainer. And I, and I think they might. Um, I think they might. Like it, it seems like over the last few months, they've been working more and more on like indexing content. And I don't know if you saw where it's like now TikTok videos can, can show up in like Google, yes. uh, Google search results. Although like, I don't know, is Google gonna push a TikTok video Maybe over YouTube. like a YouTube <laughs> video? Probably not. Um, but like, I, I think it I think it could go in that direction. Um, but yeah, really only only time will tell. So I, we're almost done here. I, I wanna be conscious of your time and I definitely wanna have you on here again in the future. So I don't wanna use up all of our talk points. Uh, but so what are your favorite travel destinations as like sort of a digital nomad? Ooh. I know you've been everywhere. Yeah, that's a really good, really good question. So. The, the two that I've lived in the, the longest, right, was Playa del Carmen, Mexico. I was there for about a year and then... Oh, wow. Yeah. I was there earlier this year. Beautiful place. Um, mm -hmm. I loved it there. It was like a super healthy balance of like being, I want to call it like Americanized to a point, but also mm -hmm. like you're you're still in Mexico and like you still have these super, super like local areas all around you. Um, it was actually a really good destination for someone leaving the U S like to leave, to, to move for the first time. Um, and then Medellin, Colombia, which is where I am right now. Like it is incredible here. Uh, there's a really, really strong, like digital nomad entrepreneurial culture. There's so many like great things to see close by. And you're also in this like super modernized city, like, I didn't even realize till coming here, but like I'm, I'm from the greater Philadelphia area and like the city's bigger than Philadelphia. And I was like, oh wow, that's, uh, that's super surprising for me. But next up is I'm going to Nicaragua for two months. Um, I also loved Costa Rica. Uh, I was only there for a few weeks, but like Costa Rica was beautiful. But yeah, just Central, Central America in general has been, uh, has been incredible. The, the Spanish still isn't where it needs to be, but that's slowly being worked on. Um, but yeah, man, for anyone looking for travel destinations, those, those two, Playa del Carmen and Medellin, that's where I've lived the, the longest outside the States and they're both beautiful locations. I love that, man. Yeah. Yeah. Playa, Playa was amazing. I, I definitely enjoyed my time there. And, uh, I had a buddy that was there with us who was nearly fluent in Spanish. So he definitely helped quite a bit, but, uh, I will just say, I definitely learned a few words, um, while I was there. That was definitely made a ton of fun. And I, I love the, the Spanish language. It's, it's, it's awesome. But uh, yeah, so I'll definitely, I'm gonna add uh, 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 Medellin to my list. And then also Nicaragua, a bunch of my buddies have said that that's fantastic and also uh, a crazy return for what you, you pay too. Yeah. So that would be, 
that's what I'm looking forward to hearing how you enjoy that. But the last question I have for you today, man, is just a very classic uh, podcast question. So it's a hypothetical scenario for you. You get to host a dinner party. You are picking the main course as well as dessert, and you get to pick the three guests, and they can be anyone ever in the history of the world, dead or alive. How are you putting this together? Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, let's start. Let's start with the food. Let's start with the food. So, pick the. Sorry, say it again. Pick the dessert. Pick the main course, and it's main course and dessert. It's dinner. Yeah, it's, it's dinner. All right, I'm going to throw a, a wrinkle here. I actually want breakfast. I want breakfast food for dinner. I'm a huge like nice. breakfast breakfast fan, so I want some eggs. I want bagels, sausage, uh, some smoothies, some smoothie bowls, some granola. I want all the – some avocado toast. I want all the traditional breakfast food there. Um, Love it. Dessert, we're going to go carrot cake. Um, I don't Ooh. know why I'm, I'm feeling carrot cake right now. But okay, this is the this is the the more interesting part. Any person in the world, three people you said, right? Yeah. So not including yourself. There's gonna be four yeah. of you total. Wow, man, this is super interesting. Okay, the the first person that comes to mind, I think, is probably just from this conversation, is Mr. Beast. I want I want Mr. Beast there. Um, Sweet. Because I I do love his story and i do want to learn more about youtube um i recently just watched that like the interview with him and and joe rogan where like he was talking about how he got into youtube and just like all the hours that he like poured into it just absolutely studying and just analyzing the little things um that's the first person that i thought of man this is tough dude this is tough I want Gary V as well. I'm just going to get, this is, this is turning into like, it's going to be a content creator conversation, but that's where my head is. That's where my head is at right now, which is completely fine. But yeah, I'm going to go with Gary V as yeah. the second person. And then, okay. I want Satoshi Nakamoto there as well. So that's the founder of Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. My, so and, no one, and no one knows yeah, so who he is. So like, yeah, you would. You would then know who he is. That'd be the. No, that's he, actually a fantastic answer. He can wear a mask, though. I'll give him. Oh, wow. I'll give him that. Him or you're her. Such a, you're such a or nice they. guest, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very important. But that man, that, that's that's a good answer. Uh, that's that, that, that's that's probably the, that last one's probably the best answer I've ever heard because that's someone who no one knows who that is. So imagine being able to ask that person questions, knowing who they are in terms of like knowing it's them. Yeah. No. You you uh you cut a little bit at the end there, but yeah, no one no one knows who it is, but like. I don't know. This is something that we haven't talked at all, but I'm like super fascinated about that space. And it's like something that's only going to continue to grow and grow. So yes. like being able to speak with, uh, you could call it like the, the, the godfather of crypto, whoever, <laughs> of crypto. whoever it might be. I think it would be fascinating. That'd be a, a pretty great way to enjoy some carrot cake for sure. So uh, the last <laughs> piece here is how can everyone get in touch with, uh, with you? How can they work with you? How can they work with uh, brands, me creators? Uh, what, what's, what's all the way to, best ways to get in touch with you? Yeah, I would say the best place to go is probably just my TikTok. It's just Mike.Rama, M-I-K-E dot R-A-M-A. And from there, you'll be able to find everything. Uh, my link's there, and you'll find our website, brandsmeetcreators.com. Um, if you are a brand looking for content creators to work with, feel free to go through there, schedule some time with me. If you're a content creator who just like, hey, I want some opportunities, like I would love to work with brands, feel free to sign up for our email list. I send out brand opportunities every week. I think we have about seven open right now, including an opportunity where you're going to get flown out to Bali, uh, free month accommodations there and make content for a brand and get paid for it. So if you're a creator looking for opportunities, uh, feel free to hit me up there as well. Yeah, man, I saw that one. That, that one got me excited. I was like, I want to apply to that. That's sweet. But yeah, uh, it's a crazy world we live in and I think you're doing something awesome. So definitely check out all of Mike's stuff, get in touch with him. Everything will be linked in the show notes of this if you're listening to the audio version. And if you're watching over on YouTube, it's in the description box for easy plug and play access. So thanks so much, Mike. I appreciate all your time and I can't wait to have you on here again, man. Ben, appreciate it, brother. Peace, man.